Hi, my name is Mike DiStefano and I'm part of the piano faculty here at God's Bible School and College. I want to talk to you today a little bit about how to create a sacred arrangement that is coherent and meaningful. A lot of times we as pianists come up with lots of great ideas and sometimes it can be a struggle to just sort of put them together into something that really has a beginning, a middle, and an end and really communicates what we're trying to say. So I want to see if I can't give us all uh, some pointers on how to work on that. Some guiding principles uh, that I want to start out with that kind of govern everything that I'm going to talk about are these three things. Simplicity, text-centeredness, and coherence. Simplicity. Uh, honestly, when it comes to creating a sacred arrangement, less is more. A great idea is to keep a notebook or some kind of sound file or somehow organize the ideas that you get in one place. But a lot of times we as pianists, and I've done this lots of times, so it's come to the temptation to put all of our good ideas into one arrangement. This can be literally exhausting for your audience. And so I just want to start out by saying, usually when it comes to creating a sacred arrangement, less is more. The second idea I want to kind of talk about is probably in some ways the most important one, the idea of text-centeredness. When you're in a sacred setting for a church service or something like that and you're sharing an arrangement, even if you have the words projected or, or in a bulletin or some way that people can see them, the words, the text of the song that you're communicating is still the guiding force in your arrangement. Everything has to come back to communicating that text. The way you phrase it, the way you put it together, the emotional content, everything is going to be guided by what the text of the piece is actually saying. The third kind of guiding principle is the one I want to spend time on today, and that is the principle of coherence. It sounds strange to say it, but I need reminded of this just as much as anyone else. When you create an arrangement, it needs to have a clear beginning, a clear middle, and a clear ending. It needs to have that balance. And all of this is going to be guided by um, this kind of principle of the same but different. You really want something that keeps having a sort of element of familiarity to it so that people are always having something. When you're listening to it, there's always something to latch on to as an audience member. There's always something that feels familiar. There's always something that says, oh, I know what's going on. That helps your audience feel comfortable. That keeps your audience listening. However, you kind of got to balance that with variety. If it's the same texture, the same key, the same feel the whole way through, it's going to be the easiest thing in the world to lose your audience somewhere about a third of the way through. So you're going to balance sameness with difference. You're going to balance variation with this comfort level of, oh, I really understand what's going on. So let's get into it. Beginning. How do you want to start the piece out? Well, there are a couple of ways to do this really effectively. One of my favorites, and one I've used a lot of times, is to create introductory material that uses a fragment of the tune. For instance, here's an arrangement that I created um, of Greatest Thy Faithfulness. It's one of my favorites. And this is the introduction. <laughs> into the, you know, actual body of the uh, hymn. But I created that, that fragment. The first phrase is, great is thy faithfulness. So we take one of those notes and displace it an octave. And then we just sort of play with the melody a little bit. And that interval, that big, long seventh interval in the middle, just really catches your interest. 
and then we sequence it. And, and throughout the arrangement, that actually, that fragment appears uh, over and over and over again to kind of unify the piece and bring it together. So that's one way to do it. You might also just want to start out with a simple accompaniment pattern that kind of sets up the mood and the feel and the, the, the just the emotional content. Here's a fragment of another arrangement I created of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. It's another one of my favorites. And I just sort of start setting it up with this gentle accompaniment pattern, which really sets the mood. The shepherds are out there, you know, in the fields. It's peaceful, it's Christmas. So you kind of just set up the mood really simply. Again, don't underestimate the power of simplicity. And honestly, if we're going to go there, sometimes it's just effective to start the piece out right off the bat. Don't set it up. Just use the opening phrases of the song itself to start the mood. For instance, if you did something like... We're right into the piece. You have communicated through the way that you're voicing it, through the style that you're playing, exactly what the piece is saying. And you've grabbed people's interest from beat one without doing anything introductory. So we've kind of set it up. We've started out. Now we get to the middle. Here's where you can have the most fun. Here's where you can vary the material and really, really play with it. Once you've introduced the material, we've heard it, we've absorbed it, we know what we're listening to. The text is still your guide, so we need to still have a clear melody line. The tune still really needs to communicate the text, but here's where you can have fun. A lot of times, people like to do a key change. That's simple and effective. You can also, if you want to, just kind of play with your audience and do a false key change. I'm starting it out in E flat. Um, I'm ending the first stanza. all over the place. I came back to E flat, but I did enough variation in the middle that the audience kind of went on a journey and it feels like a new place. So you can change the key. You can do a false modulation, what we call a false key change, where you just sort of wander away and then bring it back to where you were before and nobody knows the difference. Another great way to play with things in the middle is with register changes. You've been playing the melody with your right hand, you can play it with your left hand. You've been playing it kind of in this middle to low register where it's beautiful and mellow. Play it in a higher register or even a lower register. You have to be careful there because it can get too muddy. Uh, here from that earlier example of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear is the second stanza. I've changed the key, gone from E flat to G major, and I've put the melody in the left hand and added an accompaniment pattern in the right. This is also a great place to experiment with reharmonizing the tune, something that I'm going to talk about in uh, a video that's coming. And so you've got a beginning, we've introduced the material, we've played with the material, of course in accordance with the emotional context of the text. Now we want to land that plane. You have the beginning, you have the middle. How do you just bring it in to a close so that people feel a sense of closure, a sense of coherence, a sense that we've been somewhere and we came back. Some of this really depends on the emotional content of the piece. Again, is the piece, is the arc of the story of the piece, the arc of the content, the emotional arc, is that uh, triumphant? Um, for instance, last stanza of 
uh, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear is really wonderful. It's talking about uh, the age of gold, when peace or all the world shall its ancient splendors fling. So we get this nice big, you know, Also notice that I'm using a wider range of the piano. My hands are far apart and I'm using a lot more range. That gives us a bigger sound, that gives us a bigger feel. I feel more expansive when I play that third stanza. You can also just really bring it in. You know, if you've kind of kind of given it um, time to grow towards the end of the second stanza where you've been really playing with it, the third stanza, if it's a more reflective text, Maybe something that you really, really want to bring, uh, bring home with a really reflective, echoing kind of um, more peaceful, more tranquil feel. Um, you may have set it up with a big key change or, or something like that, which again, it, you can experiment with that. But you might want to just really, really bring it in, which I actually really do at the end of my arrangement of Great Is Thy Faithfulness. I shared a little bit of that with you early. Um, and it, it has kind of a big, more um, expansive section at the beginning of the third stanza. And I actually do a key change in the middle of the last stanza, which even just ramps up that emotional content just a, a little bit more. And then I'm going to do that traditional thing where we repeat, great is thy faithfulness. Um, it's tradition, but it really works here. really beautiful, intimate, reflective ending that, that I think captures the essence of what this piece is saying. And we end it with a fragment that we began it with, again, giving us that coherence. If your piece is more triumphant, you might want, you know, something bigger. You know, that kind of thing. Although, let me caution you, um, don't draw it out too long. It's better to ha leave your audience wanting a little bit more than wishing you had maybe stopped a few cadences earlier. You know, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, so that is some tips. I hope it's helpful to you as you're creating your own arrangements to use your creativity to glorify God. Our God that loves things that are beautiful. Our God that loves things that are coherent, that bring things to resolution and leave us with a complete thought about who he is and what he does. <laughs>